Tonight, Twitter tightens its grip on abuse, smartwatches that put style first, and it's a battle royale between llamas, address, and net neutrality. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 284 for Friday, February 27th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you can grow and protect your wealth. Best of all, it's free. And for a limited time, Twit viewers could qualify for up to $10,000 on any new account. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Howell, not Megan Maroney. I'm sitting in for her today. And uh, right off the top here, joining me to uh, talk about some of the news of the day is Selena Larson, staff writer at The Daily Dot. How's it going, Selena? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, we've got a couple of your stories, actually, to talk about here that you've been working on the past few days. Let's start with Twitter. We've talked a lot on this show, in particular, uh, in the past about online harassment. and Twitter commonly comes into fire in that discussion. Lately, we've seen Twitter release improved tools and policy for its users who are encountering abuse using the service. They first rolled out tools last December, but yesterday they announced some new changes. What are some of those changes? Yes, yeah, so essentially in December, what happened was they made it easier to report harassment in particular. Basically, third party um, people who are watching this interaction happen can report different accounts for harassment. Um, they streamlined the entire reporting process, so it was very mobile friendly and it wasn't you know, getting lost in this, this endless loop of uh, trying to report uh, people who are harassing your friends. So essentially they brought that to harassment and what they did was expand it so across all types of abuse on Twitter. So now um, third parties can report impersonation, self-harm, um, people that are doxing or, or releasing private information it's very easy to report that now as a third party. And they also brought that whole, the UI, to these other reporting processes as well. So essentially, it's now they're making it a lot easier to report people for abuse on mobile. Excellent. Um, are, are users seeing these changes that were announced yesterday? Are they seeing those now or when, when do those roll out? Yeah, so um, Twitter says that they're rolling out to everybody in the coming weeks. Um, and another thing that they also announced yesterday, too, was there's going to be greater communication with people who have been reported for abuse. So essentially, if your account has been taken down or reported in any way, Twitter will email you directly and say, hey, you've been reported for abuse. This is against our guidelines. Whereas previously, they were just like, oh, here's a link to our rules and policies. And it didn't explicitly say, these are the rules that you violated. And additionally, if you, you, if you have been locked out of your account for abuse, uh, Twitter will require you to validate your identity either through email or phone um, to, to get back in there. So they're really putting an effort, really emphasizing the fact that like calling out people for um, abusing the service. Yeah, a little less passive, a little more active in that regard. Now, you exactly. also um, received a harassment survey from Twitter this morning. Would you say this is kind of indicative of uh, Twitter's kind of renewed concern and attention to this matter? And do you think that's effective? Absolutely. So it was really interesting because this was something that I hadn't seen before. And it, it asked me, have I ever experienced abuse? How does Twitter deal with abuse? What's it compared to abuse that I receive on other net? other social networks. It was very, uh, fairly, fairly comprehensive. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of ways for me to, to respond, not, not just, you know, select check boxes, you know, I could explain the different types of abuse that I've been experiencing. And, um, a lot of them were tailored to, um, verified users in particular. So I'm not sure if this is something that they're starting with verified users who do tend to be more high profile and, uh, receive, uh, occasionally receive more abuse. Um, but it is something that, that you can tell that they're taking it very seriously and they really want to engage with the with the community. And the, the final question on the questionnaire was, will you feel comfortable talking to Twitter about your um, your experiences with harassment? Would you be willing to, you know, open up that dialogue and have a conversation about how they can improve, um, Im improve the harassment reporting? Right, right. Um, and just kind of finally, real quick, I don't know, have, has there been any sort of indication from Twitter as far as how successful their changes have been? I mean, obviously, it, it only happened in December, so it's only been a couple of months, but uh, are we seeing some success there? Are they talking about that at all? 
you know, they're remaining fairly mum about everything. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had reached out to Twitter to say, you know, who is receiving these surveys? Um, what types of information are they getting from this? How are they going to implement it? I think we're still in the very early stages of even understanding how um, these reporting tools are going to impact users. And unfortunately, there is still a lot of harassment happening and people are still receiving emails from Twitter that say particular harassment isn't necessarily against their guidelines. Mm -hmm. But a few weeks ago, Dick Costello admitted that the company sucks at dealing with this stuff. And so um, with all of these changes, you can definitely tell that it's something that they're taking very seriously. And hopefully the user feedback will even improve that even further. Right. The first step is to look inside and realize you have a problem. Mm -hmm, uh, exactly. So good on Twitter. All right. Switching gears, literally. But <laughs> We have a new breed of watches that um, aim to fuse the style of traditional timepieces by such makers as Frédéric Constant, Mondaine, Alpina, uh, with the smarts of modern wearable technology. It's very interesting. Tell me a little about what the Swiss horological smartwatch, you know, what makes that different from things like Apple's, you know, Apple Watch, Pebble, Android Wear? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm one of those consumers who isn't going to buy an Apple Watch or a Samsung Gear or any of these, you know, these, these smartwatches only because I wear watches as pieces of jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wear them as accessories. I don't necessarily need something on my wrist that does similar things to my phone, right? So actually I was very excited about this announcement because um, I, own, I own a lot of watches and what these companies did was actually take the design and the, the, the piece of jewelry essentially and make it smarter. And everything that's in there, it's not like the quartz watches, which they've been building. Uh, that's, those are quartz watches are like the traditional watch. Mm -hmm. um, but what they did was kind of like gut it. They kept the, the exterior design and just put inside uh, smart technologies, essentially. So it acts a lot like a fitness tracker. In fact, it's the same company that um, is behind the Jawbone Tech is also the company that that um, built the tech for these smart watches. And they have battery lives of up to two years, which is better than anything on the market. Alpina's, yeah. Yeah, Alpina says that um, their watch can go up to three years and they have um, one of the, the nicest sport watches as well as um, the, the diamond encrusted watch that I I particularly thought was really pretty. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's showing this shift because these, these Swiss companies have been making watches for generations. I mean, and, and they really stress this, you know, this is something that um, a, a really nice timepiece is something that you can pass down through your family, right? So if you mm -hmm. inherit something from your grandfather and you can pass it on to your own kid and it's, and it's really taking this, this, this generational idea of having something very special it is a piece of technology. Watches have, you know, been pieces of technology, but it's just making that a little bit smarter, but maintaining its history of being something that's really timeless. So it's much different than anything that you're going to find from any gadget company. There's no screen, there's no text alerts, there's no phone calls or GPS. Really what it is, it's a fitness tracker. So it tracks your steps, your calories, um, your sleep, and that's something that they're uh, they are really passionate about too, is like making sure people are um, getting proper night's sleep and setting goals of, of steps or calories or um, these different like quantified self applications. And um, it connects to your phone just like any other smartwatch. And it just happens to look like a traditional quartz watch. Right. Yeah, exactly. It kind of seems like we're starting to see the first true breed of smartwatches, if you want to call these smartwatches, although they're not as far reaching from functionality as, as like you were saying, like Android Wear or Apple watches. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, a new breed of smartwatches is tailored for both men and women in ways that are unique to to them, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to just being like, well, this is round, so men and women will wear it. You know, it's, it's kind oh, of a absolutely. different story. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's something that they all really stressed uh, last night at the event too, was that these, these pieces are focused, or they're built with the fashion and the design in mind, right? And Alpina even said that, that there's no there's no tech company out there that's building a watch specifically for women, and that's something that they're really focused on. They have both men's and women's lines of their watches, and so that's exactly what they're going to build for their smart watches as well. Yeah, they look really nice. Um, how much are these going to cost, and when can people get them? Yeah, so uh, these are supposed to be available um, in May. The on the low end is going to be about five hundred, all the way up to a thousand. And there is one company um, for the the Helvetica line. They will be 
around starting at two, 250. Um, so this actually is like a pretty standard price point for um, really nice quartz watches as well as um, it, might, it might be a little on the higher end of your traditional smart watches, but these are made to last for years. The battery lasts for years. And then after that, the actual physical um, piece of, of technology, the watch is built to last for a very long time. Right on. Selena Larson at The Daily Dot. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was great. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Where can, uh, where can people follow your work online? Yeah, of course. I'm at dailydot.com and at Selena Larson. Right on. on Twitter. Have a great weekend, Selena. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take right. care. You too. All right, coming up, Google's working on an all-new campus, and the plans, I have to say, are pretty spectacular. But first, it's a new year. Time to start investing smarter. Personal Capital has an easy way for you to do it, plus a very special offer for Twit listeners. For a limited time, when you open a new Personal Capital account, they'll give you $100 for every $100,000 you deposit up to $10,000. It's a win-win. You get cash in your account and personalized investment advice from the registered investment advisors. Schedule your free one-on-one -on -one investment consultation today. I don't know how long this offer is going to be available. So just do that today with their award-winning financial app. You can monitor your income spending, uh, the performance of your investments, all in real time on a single easy to read screen. You can find and eliminate high mutual fund and 401k fees and other hidden brokerage fees that may be costing you years off your retirement. And best of all, this is a big one, it's free. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better financial decisions, manage your, your portfolio like a pro. So why wait? Now is the time to invest smarter and open a Personal Capital account. Make taking control of your financial future one of your resolutions for 2015. Go to Personal Capital now and set up your free account for a limited time. If you qualify, Personal Capital will give you $100 for every $100,000 you deposit up to $10,000. That's personalcapital.com slash TN2. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, on to a few more stories we're following today. First, Leonard Nimoy, who is most widely known as playing Mr. Spock on the irrefutably classic Star Trek series, has died of pulmonary disease. Nimoy had earlier this week been hospitalized with breathing difficulties, but was later released to his home where he passed away earlier this morning. Now, obviously, Nimoy was a cultural icon, particularly in the tech community. And as such, tributes began flooding in throughout social media, most citing Mr. Spock's popular catchphrase. We've all heard it. Live long and prosper. Coincidentally, Nimoy's last tweet was particularly prophetic in light of this news. On last Sunday, he tweeted, quote, a life is like a garden. Perfect moments can be had but not preserved, except in memory, live long and prosper. Leonard Nimoy was 83. We've all seen and heard plenty about Apple's plans for its futuristic new headquarters that looks more like a gigantic spaceship made of glass than anything else. Not to be outdone, Google is also working on building its new offices from scratch, and the plans are pretty remarkable. Google is working alongside Danish architect Bjark Ingels and London designer Thomas Heatherwick to create a new campus in Mountain View, California, that's meant as much for Googlers as it is for residents. For residents, the expansive grounds will indeed be open to the public, including bike paths and retail locations for businesses and restaurants to inhabit. But for employees, the structures will be constructed of lightweight materials that are both translucent to let in as much outside light as possible. And get this, movable meaning <laughs> teams that work in one section could actually move that section to another area of the campus to allow for more accessible collaboration. Kind of crazy. The company's using canopies in lieu of walls, windows, and roofs uh, to keep the overall work environment open and airy. And once it's open, I want to go there and see it. The White House released new draft legislation that would afford consumers tighter control over their data that's kept by companies conducting business online. The Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights Act of 2015 would place rules on how user data is shared, how it's stored and sold to third parties by addressing advertiser analysis, there's third party aggregation, as well as internal usage inside a company. 
The companies would also be required to disclose to its customers how exactly that data is being used and offer tools to allow its users to manage and remove that information if they so choose. Almost immediately, of course, the tech sector worried about stifled innovation if the legislation passes in its current state. And on the other side, advocates of privacy warned that it didn't go far enough to protect users. The draft is part of Pre President Obama's renewed promise from his State of the Union address in January to focus on consumer privacy and security. All right, and finally, what do two llamas address and net neutrality have in common? Well, honestly, not a whole lot, except that they all took social media by storm yesterday. And while this in and of itself isn't really news, it's kind of interesting to analyze what we as a collective hive mind find most important when presented with those three options. So first, what am I talking about? One, two llamas ran loose on the streets of Arizona and a live stream was there to pass video of it onto the world in real time. Two, a picture of a striped dress has people taking passionate sides on whether it's white with gold stripes or blue with black stripes. And three, the Federal Communications Commission voted three to two in favor of reclassifying broadband internet as a utility. Now, any one of those is particularly tailor-made for viral success, but when they happen on the same day, we end up with hardcore data crunching by companies like Chartbeat, which points to this. The llamas though passionately followed, were but a blip on the radar. I thought it was pretty cool. The net neutrality ruling, a complicated but long-awaited outcome, had some uptake at first and then totally petered out. Right about the time that the damn dress came into the room and everybody started staring at it for hours. Yep, we all stared at that dress for a long, long time. And you should feel bad about it, especially if you thought it looked blue and black in that picture, because it doesn't, even though the dress actually is. But I don't see it, so you're wrong. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And do not miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. That's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Ron Burgundy. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.